Hello everyone, welcome to Armchair Art Tours Garden Series. Today we'll be talking about Sissinghurst and Monk's House in Kent. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Melanie Blake and I'm the Director of Classical Pursuits. I'm here today with Samantha Clark, Marketing Manager at Worldwide Quest, and of course with Wendy O'Brien, a philosopher, specifically a phenomenologist, uh, an art scholar with more than 30 years of teaching experience and a keen gardener, albeit one who loves winter and snow as well. Um, <laughs> I'll turn it over to Wendy in just a moment. I first want to briefly review the features of GoToWebinar that you'll need and tell you a little bit about what's coming up at Classical Pursuits. So your interface might look a little different depending on how you're accessing the webinar. Uh, you might have either uh, labels like audio or questions that identify the different features or icons. Um, there's just a couple features that are important for you. The first is audio. Um, so you, may, you might see a microphone icon or a speaker or the word audio. If you click on the word or the icon, you can expand the field and adjust the settings to your liking. And uh, the other main question or the other main feature is questions. Uh, this might be a question mark icon or the word questions. Again, click on that to expand the field, type in your question and um, we'll see it. We'll do a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. If you are having audio or video problems, um, we'll also help you out as best we can. Usually a lot of problems uh, are related to connectivity and they resolve in a couple minutes. So we have a lot of familiar faces who have been joining us for these webinars, but also some new people who, uh, who might not know what Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest do. Um, so we organize literary and cultural trips around the world and Classical Pursuits also runs an annual summer salon in Toronto. We're not traveling right now, of course, but we do have a lot of online programs, uh, both free and paid for you. Next week, Wendy wraps up the garden series uh, by taking us across the Atlantic to Frida Kahlo and her Casa Azul in Mexico City. And then um, I'll be doing a webinar mini series on the war that used up words, talking about literature and culture of World War I. Lisa Passold will be back with uh, another virtual walk in Paris. And then for our webinars, or sorry, our seminars, which is a smaller a small group experience, more interactive. Um, we're launching a whole bunch of new webinars, uh, seminars in the next uh, next few days, including uh, Charles Dickens' Bleak House, uh, Women Painters, led by Wendy, um, King Lear, Classics of Canadian Literature, uh, the work of Charles Darwin, and a lot more. You can see more information on our online programs page at Classical Pursuits or you can always give me a call, send me an email, and I'll be happy to help you. Before I turn it over to Wendy, I have a quote that a participant sent us last week uh, that I thought would be very fitting for today's, uh, today's webinar. This is from the British writer, Beverly Nichols. She says, if you are privileged to own a bit of earth, it is your duty both to God and man to make it beautiful. That's enough from me. I'll see you back at the Q&A and over to Wendy. Well, hello everybody, and thank you for joining me uh, today uh, to take a look at two more gardens in this series. Um, now, if you were with us last week, last week we took a look at this, at the beautiful gardens in Giverny uh, that were created by Monet, created literally uh, with his very hands. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, how he was interested in and all the elements and aspects of horticulture and how he loved to get out into the garden itself. But about how his garden on, in dirt uh, and plants and also his amazing garden as it's depicted uh, on the canvas. Uh, when I was talking about him, I hadn't really thought about the relationship between his garden in Giverny in France and, and that of, um, uh, of um, Vita Sack the West and uh, Virginia Woolf that we're gonna take a look at today. Um, I had told folks that I'd been missing the world and I'd been missing gardens in particular, traveling to them and being able to walk through them. Uh, here in shelter, 
we're still isolating in place and our parks are even closed. We're not able to, to go into public spaces. And it got me to think about gardens kind of differently, about what their role was for us. And, and, and looking at this beautiful painting of the water lilies, one of many that we discussed and had a chance to look at with Monet last week, I, I had described the fact that for him, well, here he is painting. Uh, he was painting in 1914, hearing the bombs um, close to where he was in France go off. And, and I kind of remarked on his ability to find such beauty in hard time and what a model that was for us. And, and that you could find beauty right where you were, that you could find beauty in these places and spaces that we call home. Uh, that we could find beauty in small, tiny, delicate things. And I suppose in some ways that, that's a, as good an introduction as I can offer also to the amazing gardens at Sissinghurst. Sissinghurst is also created in the shadows of dark days. Dark days for Vita Sacco West on the outside and dark days on the inside. Uh, yeah, her garden is phenomenal. It is a study in great beauty. I love that quote and thank you to whoever sent it uh, because it's perfect for what Vita was up to, what she was on to. Um, one thing that uh, oftentimes people don't know is that she was a great poet. And um, I, I thought this quote from uh, her sonnet seemed apt in relationship to her garden. She wrote, my garden is all overblown with roses, my spirit all overblown with rhyme. As like a drunken honeybee, I waver from house to garden and again to house and undermine which delight to flavor, to favor on verse on, and rose alternately carouse. It, it is like a poem turned into plants, turned into white and into green. Yeah, she was creating her place and her space in dark times, as was a neighbor close by. This is Monk House Garden, Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf's garden, which was not all that far away from uh, Sissinghurst. Again, this study in great beauty. And well, I wanted to place these two gardens in context, I guess. Um, oftentimes, I think we look at gardens as horticulture, more akin to farming than to art. But I think for both Sackville West and also for Wolf, they were much more than that. They have more in common with art than, than farming. I, I want to place them this afternoon in that kind of context before we actually look at the work. I want to give us a kind of new lens, I guess, on which to appreciate their amazing um, studies in color and in light in the places that they found themselves in. And, and in order to do that, I, I hope you'll entertain me for a few minutes uh, as I go through a brief history of British landscape painting. Um, I, I think we can put them into a tradition that, well, really started in the mid 1700s in England, a, a tradition that in many ways they continue continuing not with paint, with brush stroke on a canvas, but they continue with ground. And ground is a, an important word, I think, for them, because I think for them, as interestingly, for the British landscape painters, painters that we'll look at in a minute, like Gainsborough and Constable and, and Turner, these paintings gave us grounding, grounding, physically and grounding psychologically in times of incredible change and disruption. So just a, a brief history of British landscape painting. Because, well, really, landscape painting in England doesn't start until this guy really comes along. This is Thomas Gainsborough. Prior to Gainsborough's work, well, landscape painting, landscape painting, wasn't really considered painting at all, let's be honest. Uh, those people who were busy copying nature, making imitations of what they saw, they were considered to be closer to topographers than they were to painters. 
Yeah, it, it took a while. It would take until Thomas Gainsborough came along for that attitude or that aptitude towards landscapes to change in England, uh, to change in, in a couple of ways, I guess. Um, if there were landscapes to be painted, they were always um, somewhere else. You know, if you wanted to paint a landscape, you went to Italy, where landscape painting was a tradition and where there was the beautiful light and the beautiful countryside. Or, or even, well, for a while, there was a, a Dutch Renaissance in landscape painting. But for the British, to paint the place that you were, well, it was a, a nice hobby, perhaps a, a, an interesting sort of trip. All of that changes with Gainsborough, who wants to focus on the place where he is. Now, this is a very early painting of, of his. It's a, of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. And, and, and you see in it well, almost a hesitation towards painting the landscape that surrounds them. They're still right up front in the forefront of this painting. It is humans, it is the portrait still here that's important to Gainsborough. But things would shift for him at, at, oh, across his lifetime. You know what, every time I see this, it, it amazes me. Uh, take a look once more at the difference between this and this. All of a sudden for Gainsborough, you know what? The landscape was important. The place and space that we were in was important. And so we started to create works that looked like that. He started to create landscapes to, hmm, I guess, valorize that tradition of, of, of landscape painting and, and to make it very clearly about the English landscape. You didn't need to go to Italy to paint what you saw there in the countryside. You could paint what was right here. Gainsborough, I think, often is overlooked for um, what he contributed in this regard to landscape painting. He's really the, the progenitor of British landscape painting. A and he moved across his career. Uh, what a beautiful painting this is as well. Look at the vibrancy of the color and always notice clouds in the sky. Uh, I know I have a few friends who are tuning in from England and, and I thought you'd appreciate the, the, the cloudy skies. Though I hear at the moment you have bright sunshine. Well, here in Ontario, Canada, we've got your clouds. Gainsborough started the tradition really. He, like I said earlier, valorized or gave credibility to the tradition of British landscape. But really, the person that's most um, to be admired for reviving this idea that the land was important to creating the, well, to creating the school of really landscape painting in England but was, was John Constable. What he did was he picked up what Gainsborough started and he pushed it forward. He challenged some of our notions what he was doing was, well, he was painting in a very interesting time period in British history, a time of great change and disruption. When um, Constable painted images like this, the industrial revelation was going on. And what we saw with the rise of the industrialization, I think Dickens in this context, is the creation of, you know, I always think of the mills during, as kind of indicative of the Industrial Revolution. What we saw were people leaving the countrysides, coming to cities, cities that were populated with more people than, well, it's amazing to think how many people you would run into. If you grew up originally in a place that looked like this, could you imagine what it would have been like to walk through the streets of London during the beginning of the age of Industrial Revolution? Yeah, and, and the city was, well, it was dirty and it was confined. The city was the place where people worked in factories and in mills, as I mentioned before. It was a place defined by child labor, by hard labor, by long hours. And I think to a great extent, when Constable started to paint images like this one, this is his image of Wivenhoe, 
Well, what he was trying to do was, well, it was a response to um, the Industrial Revolution. It was a rethinking of the role of nature in relationship to the time. I think what he was doing in creating images like this one is in some ways, well, recapturing a lost Eden. Commentators regularly refer to his works like this one in that context. That what he was doing was, well, these images are almost nostalgic for a time that was gone, a time when people lived in the country, a, a time when a time when there was space and openness, reflection, look at the water. You know, it it, it was a romanticization, perhaps, of a time that never really was. Most people didn't get to sit by the water and reflect. Most people living in the country didn't live in castles like the ones that were here, but worked hard. It is so a romanticization, no question. But what it was doing was really celebrating a simpler time, a, a time before, and was also looking at things that were very particular. He didn't want to generalize in some ways. He wanted to focus on the particular, and he wanted you to be there right with him. Now, this is one of his paintings, um, which we can't really begin on the screen to understand. This is one of his six footers. So Constable, towards the end of his painting career, he made these enormous six foot long canvases. And this is one, and uh, again, I always want to apologize for the image on the screen and then not because at least we get a, a sense of what constable was up to here yeah he made these enormous canvases in many ways i think um anticipating the large canvases of monet those huge water lilies that if you were with me last week we looked at and perhaps for the same reason you see, see i think he made these canvases of this kind of lost eden of this idyllic country life of the landscape in England. I, I think he made them big, bigger, biggest to engulf us in them, to force us to be there and, and to think what it must be like, especially if you were in a gallery uh, at the Royal Academy looking at one of these images in London, you know, to think about the difference between the city outside and and the landscape on the canvas, uh, the city and the countryside. To think about everything that the city had given us and everything that we had lost. Oh yeah, there, it's, it's an amazing, an amazing work. And as usual, I'd suggest you go online and take a look at some of the reputable sites where you can look at these images in greater detail. But but. For the moment, I hope it gives you a sense of Constable's, well, revolution. His revolution in terms of daring to paint landscape, daring to paint the British landscape, and daring to get us to rethink about what it's like to be there, to be part of it, to be in and with nature. Now, the thing that I probably love most about this painting is I mentioned it, it's that sky. He has been described by some uh, commentators as being the uh, sky god, creating these incredible skies in all of his works. This one looks almost you know, like abstract expressionism, but hmm. look at the sky. It, it is remarkable. It, if Constable was the sky god, the, the next painter that I want to look at in our brief look at the history of British landscape painting. Wow. I got to say, he oh. was the god. What, Wendy, yeah. it's, Wendy, yeah. it's Melanie. Sorry, sorry. Real quick. So sorry. Can you just move your cursor? Uh, your cursor. Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Thank well, you so much. Thank you for interrupting and letting me know. Uh, for those of you who've never done a webinar like this, I can only see my own screen. Uh, and I can't see any of the other details. So thank you for, for that. And I wouldn't want it to obstruct this particular view because 
this is wow well, well look at this son. look at this this amazing painting this is norm castle by the artist uh, jmw turner and i have to tell you this is what i wake up to every day it's at the very end of our our bed and when i wake up in the morning it's actually the first thing that i see and it never fails to fill me with joy um the works of jmw turner well what he did is uh, well in the beginning something very similar and akin to constable uh this is one of his early works the pier at calais and you notice he's doing the same thing as uh, constable was doing not in the countryside but on the seascape uh but but the same idea of showing what it looks like to be in a place and that's important for turner in many ways and as we'll see as we look at more of his work uh, people attribute much of what Monet and the Impressionists did to the works of, of Turner um, in advance of them. Turner would go to a place, he would go to a place and he would take often watercolors uh, and, and he would do sketches that later he would transform into oils back in his studio. But he had that initial impulse to uh, paint en plein air, to go to a place and to paint what he saw. And as I mentioned, well, it's not the countryside as it was for Constable. Um, here we have the, the seaside, close to where actually um, Turner would live. We get that same idea of trying to represent what he saw in front of him. But we get that same original impulse. And, and, and I gotta say that along with Constable, not only did he have that desire to paint to paint the British um, landscape, including the seascape. But he also understood a lot that times they were a changing. He understood the importance of industrial revolution, um, an amazing painting by uh, Turner uh, of, of a train and all that the train meant and all that it brought to, to British society at the time. Oh, oh yeah, we can't too quickly or too easily contrast the sky god with the sun god. They shared the desire to replicate the countryside seascape. They shared a concern for an understanding that times were changing with industrialization. And indeed, they shared a kind of hearkening back, uh, this kind of nostalgia for things that never were. This is a, a painting that actually, a copy of which uh, it was on my wall all the way through university for me. Uh, I had always wanted to go to Venice and I first saw this painting by Turner. I think it was the first painting I actually saw by Turner ever. I, I was taken aback by it because it seemed to be everything that I imagined Italy to be. Everything I imagined I would be if I ever got more specifically to Venice. Uh, the interesting thing about this painting is if you actually go to Venice, the pieces of this image, th this isn't the Grand Canal. It's as much a reconstruction of the past as it is an actual looking at um, the landscape, at, at the seascape when you're there. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Turner was messing with us. Turner always messes with us in various ways, but he put together different parts of uh, the Grand Canal and different elements and aspects of of Venice in this image because, well, I think he understood me as a student with it on my wall, imagining going to Venice someday. I think he understood something about nostalgia. I, I think that's something of what he was doing here. Well, like I said, in these ways, Constable and Turner shared a lot in common, but, but there were differences too. You see it here in his very famous painting of Hannibal and the Storm. But he was interested in recapturing old stories to recapture the past, but in the same moment, well, he was interested in other things too. So take a look at the sky here. In some ways we see um, kind of, um, I suppose, the elements of what Constable did in his great skies with his great clouds. But 
but the sky, look at that sun. And look at what lies in the farthest part of the background. Look at the light. Because really, that is what he was the master of. He was a master of light. Well, we get elements of it here. Uh, this is uh, a mountain, Maruja, in uh, Switzerland, which he would paint over and over again in a style that was increasingly, um, well, interesting. I don't think he would have ever called it increasingly abstract. I think he would have called it increasingly realistic, realistic to the atmosphere of the place, realistic in terms of the luminosity of the place. And, and that's always with Turner a good word to keep in mind, luminosity. It was about the light and trying to capture light on a canvas. Yeah, he, he would start with works like this, but he would end up with works like this one. A another um, landscape one, a total study in and of light, of the way it is absorbed and the way it reflect, reflect and refracts. A, a phenomenal image in and of itself. Yeah, if anything, that's what Turner was all about. He was the painter of light. And because of light, he was also the painter of color. It was, I don't know, every time I look at a, a Turner, the colors pop before my eyes and there's yellows and oranges and look on the very side of the this canvas and you notice a little bit of pink yeah he wanted to show us light and he wanted us to rethink color uh, very famously he did a series of paintings based on Goethe's um, notion of light and uh, if you're interested in that you can send me a, a message and, and we can talk about it uh, uh, more but he was interested in the dark and shadow, and he was interested in the bright and light and trying to put onto the canvas this theory that Goethe had offered. Yeah, he is the painter of light and the painter of colors. Extraordinary works. And well, all you have to do is compare and contrast these and you can see how far we've come from Constable's idea of the landscape. One more, perhaps mimetic, one more representative or realistic, one more atmospheric, one more in the moment and one more in the feeling of the time and of the place. Now, you may wonder well, why we're talking about Gainsborough and a Constable and Turner when we're supposed to be talking about the Sissinghurst when we're supposed to be talking about gardens. Well, I have to say when I sat down with this idea of doing some armchair ca uh, traveling, both in painting and in place, I, I hadn't really thought about, or, or to be perfectly honest, I had assumed that there were so many people who had gone and painted Sissinghurst. I had assumed that the British landscape tradition was perhaps more ingrained uh, in my head than in reality. But, well, as I started to look at the gardens, and oh, they are so stunning, as I started to look at the gardens, I started to think about Constable and Turner and Gainsborough, and I started to realize that far from, far from being separate and distinct from the British landscape tradition, that well, Vita Sackville West and Harold Nickerson, her husband at Sissinghurst, they were doing the exact same thing. They, they, were, they were painting the landscape, but, but not with lines and color and composition, but painting it with larkspur and dahlias and tulips. They were equally interested in capturing those elements and aspects I see particularly in Turner's work, the idea of light, the celebration of color. Oh, oh yeah, a, a bit of nostalgia, a grasping for perhaps an easier, perhaps a, a better time, a simpler time. 
in the face of the changes that they were dealing with, not as it was for Constable in Turner, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, but for Sackville and for Wolfe, it was the war. It was a loss of other homes. It was a loss both on the inside and, and on the outside. And so their gardens became a place to recapture some of what they lost, um, a grounding for them physically and psychologically. Yeah, Sissinghurst is phenomenal. And here we can kind of uh, locate it. And as Melanie mentioned, uh, it's in Kent. Uh, and Monk's house is very close to uh, where Sissinghurst Castle is in England. Um, here is Vida. It was uh, the work. She's the taller of the two women in the center of this photograph. I love this photo of her because there's something of her intelligence and her daring that gets encapsulated in it. Yeah, Vida Safro West, um, she was used to living in big places. She was loose, used to being grounded. She grew up at another castle, the Knoll, uh, her family's uh, le kind of legacy, their, their um, home for most of, uh, of history since the early 1800s. And she grew up there and she was always very attached to the notion of place. She always had a sense of place. And well, when that home would be lost to her uh, as a result of Nolby turned into a, a national trust, she felt displaced and she needed to make sort of a place of her own. Uh, and this would be where she would do that. So this is an aerial view of Sissinghurst done in 1932, uh, the year that um, the uh, uh, Sackville West and Nicholson would actually move into this uh, home. They bought it in 1930, uh, but would take a couple of years to, to work on the interior. It was dilapidated uh, and, and they needed to do some work. And in 32, they would actually move in and they would begin to work on the garden, a garden that would well, be phenomenal. Now, I'm not sure how much you know about Vita Sackville West. Uh, she or she is uh, a marvelous portrait painted by her, I think by Dewey to, to give my proper attribution. And um, she was, uh, well, she was a character, no doubt. Uh, she's probably notoriously known as uh, Virginia Woolf's sort of lover, uh, sort of in the sense that, uh, well, we, we don't know how far that physical relationship went. It was definitely a marriage of minds for a particular period of time. She's probably most well known, as I said, for her life and her reputation, for her scandal her relationship with Wolf, but with many others uh, across her lifetime. What I don't think I really appreciated about her until this past week or two, as, as I was spending time thinking about Sissinghurst and, and looking at what she created there, what I really had failed to recognize was what a great poet she was. Um, along with being a gardener, she, wrote uh, over 11 novels, she wrote stories, she wrote plays. She'll have a, a very popular common, uh, column in The Observer that we'll talk about a little bit later. I, I was surprised, however, to turn to her poems and um, we'll provide you with a handout if you go to the uh, uh, website. Uh, and, and in it, I'll provide a link to two of her greatest poems, one called The Land and the other called Gar The Garden. I'll read a little bit from the garden uh, as we go on this afternoon. But yeah, she was as good a poet as she was a gardener, and that's saying something. In fact, she understood the, the links between the two. She wrote the following. She said, the fortunate gardener who may preoccupy himself solely with beauty in this difficult and ugly day he is one of the few people left in this distressful world to carry on the tradition of elegance 
and charm a useless member of society considered in terms of economics, he must not be denied his rightful place. He deserves to share it, however humbly, with the painter and the poet. When I read that line that he deserved to share the place, his rightful place, the gardener, with the painter and the poet, uh, I, I thought about the landscape tradition of which she's part of. I, I started to think about the relationship between the gardener, the painter, and the poet, and how they all kind of culminate in Sackville West and in her remarkable creations. Oh yeah, I, I, I sit back in awe every time I look at photos from Sussinghurst, at the intricacy of the design and of its sheer beauty. Uh, that's why I love the quote from Melanie that started uh, to this afternoon session about this need to take a piece of land if you have it, and, and not just care for it, but to try to make it beautiful. I, I think uh, Sackville West would have agreed, she would have approved. And, and you notice there, in her discussion, she seems to aim towards that. Yeah, it is a stunning garden, uh, which is now a national trust, but in many ways, the structure of the garden itself has remained in place from her time. The plants may have changed, but the structure that she and Harold Nicholson put in place uh, uh, remains there. It is an elaborate property and an elaborate garden, and one of the things that she did almost immediately when they, she first started to work on it, and she literally worked on it. She didn't just have gardeners to help her with it. She was out digging in the ground with them all the time. She was a great horticulturalist who believed in, well, believed in gardening with these things as much as with this thing and with this. It, it, she believed that gardening was something that you did with your hands. There was something about getting your hands in the soil for her, about pulling out weeds, about planting. It, that was important. Maybe, as I mentioned earlier, had something to do with giving herself a, a grounding, of giving herself a place in the world. This is a map of the outline of uh, a map of the gardens uh, as they existed, vegetable gardens, flowers gardens, the white garden, the rose garden. From the very beginning, she had a, a sense that she was going to create clear structure to her garden. And I think that, well, to a great extent, that idea came from this person. Uh, it was inspired by Gertrude Jekyll. Now, Gertrude Jekyll uh, is a character that if we know about her, number one, you must love gardening history, uh, or number two, you must love roses because the Gertrude Jekyll rose is still one of the most beautiful and the uh, most sought after of roses that we have. Here's uh, Gertrude as she would go out to garden, yes, in full late Victorian clothing. Um, Jekyll uh, would have, I think, loved the fact that we are linking um, Vita's garden, her work on gardening, with the works of Turner and Constable and Gainsborough before her. What oftentimes people don't know about Gertrude Jekyll is that before she was a gardener, she was a painter. This is a landscape she created of Algiers. Yeah, she painted so beautifully and, and so remarkably of, interestingly, other places, but of England as well. Now, Jekyll would give up painting quite early in her life because she had terrible eyesight. She would turn instead to gardening. She would turn away from making images like this one to creating images in the soil with plants instead. And she would do it quite literally. This is a, a work called Gertrude Jekyll's Boots. And, and I love it because I love the thought of her being out there digging down. Now, Gertrude Jekyll, well, Vita Sackville West actually had a chance to meet her uh, when uh, Gertrude was uh, 74 and she went with her mother 
uh, and had tea with Gertrude Jekyll and, and walked through parts of Gertrude's uh, amazing Munstead house. Sorry, sometimes you lose a word. Uh, she would walk through them with her and see uh, what she was doing in the garden. She, Vita Sacco West, wasn't all that impressed. It was a particularly low time in the garden. But what she got from Jekyll was important. Now, Gertrude Jekyll during her day was the authority on all gardens. And one of her basic principles that comes through to us when we see the rooms that uh, Vita Sackville West and Harold Nicholson would create in Sissinghurst it is this idea of order. Um, she held that there had to be a very clear philosophy upheld in the design of gardens. And I think this quote captures it well. For Jekyll, a garden scheme should have a backbone, a central idea beautifully phrased, and every wall path, stone, and flower bed has a relative value to that central idea. The idea of having a backbone really helps to explain, and sorry for me slipping back here, the way that uh, Vita Sackville West would design these rooms within her garden. Uh, now, the idea of the orderly garden, this carefully structured garden, she got that from Gertrude Jekyll, but she'd also seen it. She took a, a fascinating tour uh, to Persia, uh, and uh, before they actually bought Sissin, her she had gone to Persia and she said that uh, before she went to Persia and saw the gardens there, she was not a gardener, but was only gardening. It wasn't until she saw the gardens in Persia that she was actually uh, transformed into a gardener because she understood something about the principles to be upheld. Those principles, this notion of a structure or a backbone to a garden, so central to Gertrude Jekyll's ideas about what a garden should look like. Yeah, it was those principles uh, that she really applied, at least initially uh, to the layout or the design of Sissinghurst. There were a few principles. If I had to kind of boil down Gertrude Jekyll, who wrote many, many books, the Bibles of British gardening uh, at the time, uh, it would be, it would be, I guess, I, it would be, I guess, this. Um, number one was always to use color. It was to use color. And one of the things that she was really well known for is um, for saying that, you know, like edges around um, walkways and pathways, that you could mix flowers and mix colors and they shouldn't all be one color, but that you should have a celebration of color. That was really important to Gertrude Jekyll's principles or ideas about what gardens should look like. She had lots of principles. One was always to use color. Uh, another one that we'll see in, in a few minutes is uh, that white's all right. Uh, and most importantly is that you should always think about what you put in. Always think. Don't just buy plants because you like them. Uh, what you needed to do is think about the place and what would thrive and think about the color. I have to laugh when I say that because I always buy plants that I just like. Uh, I never think before I buy. I just go, oh, pretty. Uh, what would Gertrude say? Uh, Vita was much clearer in her understanding of these principles and ideas. Uh, she put them in place. Well, for example, in this, in, in this, her magnificent rose garden. The roses at Sissinghurst are astonishing, just to give you a, a sense of what they look like. Uh, amazing and full and carefully placed, an enormous rose garden that she put in place in, in different colors. Uh, you know, I go back to that first principle, to use color and to use it well. It, it's right there. She was clearly adhering to Jekyll's principles when she put it in place. Um, other things that uh, she learned uh, as she was going, as I mentioned, a celebration of color all the time. And, and also the notion uh, of white, uh, which might sound strange to us, but 
uh, maybe some of you who are gardeners uh, have tried to put in a white garden. It's incredibly difficult because if it's all white, it seems to just fade away. The intricacies and the beauty of the plants seem to get lost in a, in a sea of white. Yeah, Gertrude Jekyll spoke a lot, wrote a lot about white gardens. You could, she said, use just one color, though she highly recommended, as you see in these images, adding little bits of blue or little bits of yellow. Clearly, in her magical white garden, uh, Sackville was adhering to some of those principles that Ger Gertrude Jekyll ha had insisted upon. And man, just look at the results. What an astonishing garden, an astonishing landscape that Vita Sackville West created. Again, not with paint, but with plants, with you know shrubs and flowering bushes and trees and the flowers themselves. Oh yeah, I think she belongs in that tradition. I think all the great gardeners uh, in England belong in the tradition of British landscape, not painting, but British landscape art. Many people talking, uh, sorry, talking about uh, Vita Sackville West's garden said it was enchanted. And I have to say, when I look at pictures, when an armchair traveling with you here, I, I think about some of the great books that have been written about gardens, the great novels that have been written about gardens, novels that focus on, you know, the secret garden, the enchantments. It is, no question, enchanting. Now, there was another important British um, garden expert at the time that was writing. His name was um, William Robinson, and here's an early copy of his book. His book was called, and you can get a newer edition, it was called The Wild Garden. And he had a bit of a different approach uh, to gardening than Gertrude Jekyll. He had moved away from the notion of a, a strict structure or a backbone to a garden to something a little more organic. And, and I have to be careful when I talk about William Robinson, uh, who, again, uh, Vita Sacro West, uh, because of her social connections, was able to go and spend time with, uh, and who I believe came to Sissinghurst and walked through her garden with her at one point in time. Um, when we talk about the wild garden, I always think it should be the wilding garden. <laughs> William Robinson didn't believe in let it all go wild. He wasn't an advocate of natural or organic gardening in that sense. But what he was interested in was allowing plants to be plants. Uh, he would, for example, allow plants to self-seed. And, and he wouldn't pluck out when, you know, amidst your flocks, uh, you might have an astilabe all of a sudden appear. If you don't know a lot about plants, that's that's fine. But the whole idea was that, you know, where seeds landed, seeds would land and let them grow into the creation of your garden instead of working away from it. Probably better than talking about it, I can give you some examples of the wilding of Sissinghurst. While she initially had that very clear structure to the garden, over time, she allowed it to wild just a little, to let things uh, arise where they did. And it has equal beautiful effect. What a landscape she created. What a place of refuge, maybe of nostalgia that she made for us to appreciate, appreciate in her time and to appreciate in our own. Just before uh, we go in and take a look at her friend Virginia Woolf's garden, one that perhaps better captures the notion of wilding, better captures William Robinson's notion of what a great garden looked like, uh, a few things more about Vida and her relationship to gardening. She not only was busy in her own garden, she for many, many years had a incredibly popular column in the Observer. Uh, they've been collected and I'm sure if you go online, you can find books where uh, you can get uh, 
her advice on gardening. She wasn't Gertrude Jekyll in, in those columns in The Observer. She was much more forgiving, um, much more approachable, I'd say, much more in touch with what the average person reading The Observer would be capable of doing in their gardens than what she would be able to do in this massive property with enormous resource in hers. She was so well read, she was so well loved for her everyday gardening advice. But, well, she was even better a poet of the garden, as I mentioned to you a little bit earlier. And I can't help but think of these lines from her long poem called The Garden, which you can uh, go to Project Gutenberg and access. In looking at these images of Sissinghurst, I, I can't help but think about this that she wrote. She said, there are moments when the shadows fall and the low sea of flowers wave on wave spread to the pathway from the rosy wall, saying in colored silence, take our all you gave to us and back to you we gave. You dreamed us and we made your dream come true. We are your vision, here made manifest. You sowed us and obediently we grew. But sowing us, you sowed more than you knew. And something not ourselves has done the rest. What beautiful poetry, as beautiful as the flowers as we see in front of us. I, I love this idea that, you know, she dreamed what this place would look like and, and the plants made her dream come true. I wonder sometimes about what that dream was, whether it was a, a dream of rest in a, a world that was changing so quickly, the backdrop of the Second World War, the rise of globalization, changes in the economic structure in England, questions and challenges she had in relationship to her own sex and sexuality. You know, I, I look at Sissinghurst as I look at the paintings of Turner and of Constable, and I think of what their dreams were, uh, of what they were nostalgic for. Well, Sissinghurst is one of the two gardens I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about and looking at. The other is, well, that, that's Vita uh, towards the end of her life. And there she and Harold are. It's a very late picture uh, in their relationship. And once more, you'll notice all the photos of her is her in her garden, still dreaming, still caught up with a particular vision. Here she is as well. Notice also outdoors. Uh, I'm not sure if this is in at Sissinghurst or at Monk's house, but this is, I know it's kind of grainy, but a picture that was taken of Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf. And I wanted to take a look at Woolf's garden as another kind of dream, as a, another kind of vision. Here is Monk's house. Now Monk's house, like Sissinghurst, is now a national trust. And so when it is safe and when we can, we will have a chance to go to these places and spaces and tent and visit the gardens themselves and walk through them. But, but for now, on the screen, here we have Monk's house. Oftentimes we see the house itself and, and the interior. I, I found it kind of fascinating when I was searching for good images that I could find so many pictures of the building, uh, of the rooms inside, but so few pictures of the amazing garden that Virginia and Leonard would create. Now, these two had a very different way of organizing uh, who did what in the garden? This is always a complicated question. If there are couples watching, you know this. Who does what in the garden? At Sissinghurst, Vita was in control and Vita was out in her boots, so reminiscent of the boots of Gertrude Jekyll. She was out in the dirt and leading the gardeners and Harold did the planning. Uh, here at Monk's house, Leonard Wolf. Well, he was the, the sort of mastermind behind the garden, its design. 
he actually became an incredibly accomplished horticulturalist. Meanwhile, Virginia, well, she it was very clear. She spent her time in the garden weeding. That was her job. She had a, a different approach to the garden altogether. I apologize as I look around. I'm looking for a quote that she so lovely offered uh, about the fact that that was what she did and, and she was happy to do it. Yeah, these pictures taken of them in their garden are, are lovely and what a garden it was. Now, right from the start, what you might notice about Monk's house is that it's different in kind from um, Sissinghurst. Number one, much smaller garden, even though uh, Virginia and Leonard would buy a piece on the back a little bit later. Uh, the success of some of her works allowed them to buy more property and the garden would be extended. But their garden was, well, more akin to William Robinson's notion of the wild garden, or what I've called here the wild dang garden, than it was of Gertrude Jekyll's careful, carefully structured, carefully designed uh, garden. Th that's one of the differences that we see in these places and spaces. Uh, but, but still, this celebration of color that, uh, that is offered on display. Uh, I love this picture, and, and it often gets me to think of a passage from uh, To the Lighthouse that uh, Virginia Woolf wrote. Um, much of the action, I, I hadn't really thought about this, um, and thank you to everybody for allowing me this opportunity. I've been thinking so much about these people, about these gardens, uh, and about the artwork that they created. I hadn't really thought about how much the garden really serves as a backdrop to not only Virginia Woolf's life, but also to her, her writing, to her novels. Um, she would move here. Originally, this was bought as kind of a weekend getaway or a vacation place for the Wolves. But after their flat in London is bombed, they would move here and it would literally become the backdrop to her life. She would spend 22 years uh, writing in what they called the lodge what was a writing hut in the back of this garden. It was where she would write some of her greatest works. So the garden literally was a backdrop for Virginia Woolf's life. It's also predominant in so many of her, her works. We get discussions of, of gardens in, well, for example, Kew Garden, which is all about gardens, but it's the backdrop for the events that occur in her novel, uh, Orlando. And this picture, this image reminded me of a section from To the Lighthouse, very specifically. She wrote, poppies sowed themselves amongst the dahlias. The lawn waved with long grass. Giant artichokes towered amongst the roses. There was a fringed carnation flowered amongst the cabbages. This kind of unorganized garden uh, in her own backyard seems so reminiscent of the garden that Mrs. Ramsey describes in that place and in that space in the novel. Yeah, it, it is beautiful and spectacular. But again, notice the differences uh, with Sissinghurst, the, a lack of, or if not a lack of, perhaps a different kind of beauty that she exhibits here. Yeah, I can't help but imagine a wolf looking at this place or looking at this space and of all the things she must have imagined, the beauty that she found there and, and the great solace that she found there. She went to her garden, we're told, during good times and she went to her garden during hard times when she was struggling with the world around her, when she was struggling not only with the challenges on the outside, but the challenges on the inside. She writes in her journals about the comfort that she finds there. And well, this image in particular, I can just imagine her sitting there when illness and depression took her over and taking some small solace in these places and in these spaces, maybe an image of a, a better time, a better life, perhaps a, a little bit of nostalgia for what had been. Here she is 
uh, in part of the garden. And I don't know, I, I love this image of her. And, and I can't really tell you exactly all the reasons why, but it somehow captures my idea of what Virginia Woolf must have looked like, about what she must have been thinking as she sat in those gardens and, and as she wrote those beautiful lines. In the lighthouse, uh, here you see that passage uh, that I offered earlier, earlier about the poppies and the dahlias and other places as she writes about the daffodils. And, and there they are, there they are. A, a stunningly beautiful garden, different in kind from Sissinghurst with a beauty perhaps of its own. But, well, you know, I, I was thinking a lot of, about the history of British landscape art I'm gonna use that started with the painting, started with Gainsborough, and that we see continued here in the flower gardens of Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf. I, I was thinking about how they grounded, how they grounded those artists, how it gave them a sense of, of place a sense of where they belonged in the world or where they once belonged, of the notion of nostalgia that they somehow capture. Now, uh, taking a look, I, I know this is a uh, monk's house, but uh, just taking a look at, at this picture and thinking about these amazing gardens, about their creation and their presentation, thinking a little bit about poets, and painters and gardeners and what they share in common. I'd like to read just to end this part of our afternoon armchair traveling. I'd like to read a little piece from uh, um, another piece from Virginia, uh, sorry, Vita Sackville West's uh, poem, The Garden, from a section that's called Spring. In it, she writes the following. How fair the flowers unaware that do not know what beauty is. Fair without knowing they are fair. With poets and gazelles they share another world than this. Can't help but think that that's what all these artists in the British landscape tradition were doing. Hearkening a little to the past, imagining a better future. I I'm just gonna quickly Reread those last few lines. How fair the flowers unaware that do not know what beauty is, fair without knowing they are fair. With poets and gazelles, they share another world than this. Thank you all uh, for doing some armchair traveling with me this afternoon uh, to Sissinghurst and to uh, Monk's House, to the uh, gardens of these amazing um, women who are busy filling the pages with their images of gardens as they were filling the spaces and places around them with those same flowers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was great to get away and, and spend time among all these incredible flowers. I loved it. Um, so we are going to do a Q&A uh, period. Again, if you I do, we do have some questions, so I'll get to I'll get to those in just a moment. If you do have a question, uh, feel free to type it in. Use uh, either by uh, tapping on the word question or on the question mark icon. And a couple people were asking about uh, how can you how can they see this webinar again or get the earlier webinar about Giverny. Um, oh, I will be sending out a follow up email with links. And the Giverny webinar is will also be on our website uh, later today. Also on the website uh, later t by tomorrow, some of our new online seminars that I mentioned, um, including Bleak House and several others. So if you are in a, if you are in a position to do some of our um, our online seminars, uh, we really appreciate the support. Okay, so let me get to questions. Expand these out. Okay, um, let me start toward the beginning. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. 
Okay, uh, Riza asks, or uh, Risa or Riza asks about Turner, if he was a religious person. No, uh, he wasn't. Uh, it's one of the qualities or characteristics that got him into so much trouble. He's such a controversial uh, figure. Uh, and I gotta tell you, I can spend, and, and my poor students previously have spent days and days with me ranting and raving uh, about Turner, both his life and also his artwork and the ways that they're combined. Uh, he was very anti-establishment. And I can understand the question because all those images of light seem uh, so related to, to some sign of religion or spirituality. Um, well, I would say he, well, I know he would buck the establishment in, in traditional religion. I do find Riza a kind of, a kind of not religion, but a kind of spirituality, especially in those later paintings as he becomes more abstract and it becomes all about the light. Uh, there's something that seems bigger and better than just the mountains and the water that he's striving for. Uh, an interesting place uh, to, to try to capture that um, would be to read, uh, I know it's uh, ambitious, but I think you should all try, is to read Edmund Burke on uh, the sublime. Um, Burke came up with the distinction between the beautiful and, and the sublime. And when I look at the differences between Constable, whose landscapes are beautiful, you know, they kind of fit our models of what beauty is. There's a peacefulness to them. There's a simplicity almost to them that, you know, isn't to um, take away from their paintings, but a kind of praise and their simplicity. And, and then you put it side by side, as I did earlier in the lecture with the Turner, and you go, whoa, there's not this thing. Well, Burke's distinction between the beautiful on the one hand and, and the notion of the sublime on the other, I think does an amazing job of explaining the difference between the two. The sublime being something more complicated, something that's beautiful and awe-inspiring, something that takes our breath away, something bigger and better than ourselves that we want to just keep looking at and looking on. If I think about that distinction, well, well I think about the difference between Constable and Turner, and I find in Turner this desire for something bigger and better than just what he saw. Um, another place you can see this, in, and also kind of reminiscent of, of Turner, is in uh, the works of the Canadian artist Lauren Harris, who has this similar kind of struggle going on to capture the landscape, but to capture something more at the exact same time. Uh, so, was against religion, but I think he was seeking almost a kind of naturalism, a kind of different kind of spiritualism uh, in and through his work. Yeah, thank you for the question. Excellent question. Thanks. Um, a question, Diane wants you to um, just return to the quote at the very beginning of your, um, of your presentation about the fortunate gardener. Yes, it's a great quote, isn't it? Uh, it's from Vita Sackville West. Um, yeah, and I, I will reread it, and I think so much, and I could spend a day and a half, Diane, talking about what she has on here. This is the quote. She said, the fortunate gardener who may preoccupy himself solely with beauty in this difficult and ugly day. And I just want to stop a little bit there because I was thinking about us as I read this, you know, how lucky we are when we can get outside in what are our dark days as we face the present uh, crisis, but how fortunate the gardener is who may preoccupy himself solely with beauty in, these, uh, in this difficult and ugly day. He is one of the few people left in this distressful world to carry on the tradition of elegance and charm. And I wanna stop there too, because when I look at Sissinghurst, I do think of elegance. You know, as you follow those winding paths, as you look at the layout, it was all about elegance and charm, not the way we use the word now, almost in a negative way, the true charm, true delight and joy that we get, that, that notion of the enchanted garden that I mentioned before. He is one of the few people left in this distressful world to carry on the tradition of elegance and charm. 
a useless member of society considered in terms of economics, he must not be denied his rightful place. He deserves to share it, however humbly, with the painter and the poet. So that was from uh, Vida's uh, works herself. I will um, uh, I have a handout that we'll put up online uh, along with the link to this video uh, with some ideas about things you might want to read uh, in terms of Vida's life, in terms of assisting her. I'll be sure to put the quote at the top of the page, uh, Diane, so that you'll have it to think on. And I'll put the reference in so you can follow up on it. it it's a beautiful quote. I love that. The painter, the poet, and the gardener all sharing uh, in the same, in, in their, all in their rightful place in society. Thanks, Wendy. Um, a quick question from Norma, who was Leonard. Um, that's Leonard Wolf, Virginia Wolf's husband. Yep. Um, and... Who was the master of that garden? <laughs> Sorry, go say that again, Wendy. Sorry. Oh, oh, Leonard Wolf, a uh, great biography came out of him a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years actually now. How time flies. Uh, he was the great mastermind behind uh, Bloomsbury, the Bloomsbury group, uh, and also the great mastermind behind that garden. Uh, yeah, he was out, he had these big garden houses and he would go out and he would, you know, work on plants and seedlings and he was, yeah, he's an interesting character, um, as interesting as Virginia. Uh, maybe didn't write quite the same way, but uh, he, he was the mastermind behind that garden. And kind of following up on that, uh, Sharon and a couple others um, ask, or ask for recommendations for uh, books about the Bloomsbury Group um, and that time. So we can definitely include um, include some recommendations in the in the follow up handout and email. For um, sure. When it comes yeah. to the garden, Melanie, if I could intercede for just a few yeah, yeah, minutes. Um, this is one of the books that I'll put up, and if you can find it. Uh, it's kind of a rarity now. It's by Jane Brown. It's called Vita's Other World, a, a gardening biography of Vita Sackville West. It is astonishing, uh, partly because of the amazing photographs. And, and I tr tried really hard to take photographs of photographs. Don't do it. It doesn't work. Um, but it includes things like the lists of her plants. You know, she would make these very detailed lists of all the plants that she was going to try and all the plants that she was going to look at. Uh, it, it is a marvelous, marvelous book. Uh, the other one that I would highly recommend is Virginia Woolf's Garden, and here it is. And this one is by Carolyn Jube, who actually went and uh, was the gardener at um, Monk's house. And, and so it's beautiful photographs and reflections on what it was like to live in this place and space uh, as they try to maintain something of the Wolf's own sense and sensibility about the garden. Anyways, two that I can really highly recommend, but for sure, we'll uh, make sure we get you a, a good list of readings about this crew, about the Bloomsbury group, uh, who you saw used to visit each other uh, in these gardens. So uh, garden was important for me. Thank you for the question. Sorry, I was muted, sorry. Uh, we have a couple other recommendations from participants, so we'll include those in the, uh, in the follow-up as well. Um, I just lost my question. Uh, Paula asks, um, what cities and distance from London are both of these gardens? Um, I think they're they're both a day trip easily, right, Wendy? Absolutely. Uh, and they're usually open to the public. Uh, they've been open, Sissinger's been open to the public uh, while uh, Vita was there. She was very surprised that people wanted to come walk through her garden. And she was even more surprised. They used to charge a shilling uh, to go through. And she was constantly amazed that people would be willing to come from London and spend the day walking through the garden and pay a whole shilling. I want you to know it's more than a shilling now, uh, but yeah, easily more a day. Than a shilling. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a, yeah, no, it's more than a shilling. Uh, but you know, it does give you a sense of what the place would have been like and the beauty of it, and, and well worth the trip. Uh, I know in the handout I have for you, I have links. Uh, to both of the National Trusts at Monk's House and also at Sissinghurst, uh, where you can get information about how to travel there, what to expect, the time of day, and yes, the cost, which is, did I mention more than a show? <laughs> um, but you got to support the National Trust, right? Um, 
You know what? They, it, they have some amazing properties throughout the UK. Um, and the amazing work they do in maintaining yeah. uh, the garden. Uh, they're not exactly as uh, either uh, Virginia and Leonard Wolf would have wanted them, nor as uh, Vita had envisioned them. Just changes in climate, changes in availability, changes in sensibility are a bit different. But at least at Sissinghurst, the rooms are still in place. You still see that backbone that she thought so important. You still see, I, I can just imagine Gertrude Jekyll still walking through it and going, nope, you shouldn't do that. Nope, that was a mistake. But uh, uh, you do get a, a real sense of the time and, and of the importance of the garden for a generation that was going through such dramatic change and, and so many dark days. Thanks for the questions and make sure you look at the uh, info on how to travel there. Uh, Bobby asks about uh, about both of these gardens. They she says they had gardeners too, didn't they? They couldn't have taken care of all of that themselves. Yeah, um, Monk's house, they had a gardener uh, who helped Leonard with the garden. Uh, at Sissinghurst, she had various numbers of gardeners, different times of the year, different seasons. Uh, the number of gardeners varied. I know I remember reading one entry into a journal that she created or that she was writing where they had eight gardeners and I thought, oh, that was kind of unusual to have that many. But she was interesting because Vita Sackville West was always out there, uh, always out with them in the garden, always showing them about planting. Very clearly it was her garden and uh, she didn't just abandon it to the gardeners to do the hard work after she came up with the design. Uh, I, I loved one of the pictures I showed there of her out in her garden, and uh, the full picture has her in her boots and and her gloves on. And you know, I, I have to say, after spending this time armchair traveling to Sissinghurst and and thinking about its role in relationship to landscape art um, in general, you know, that's how I still imagine her in her garden with her boots on and and her gloves. Um, and being grounded, which was so important to her, you know, being in a place, making a place your own. Uh, so, so yes, uh, she had she had help, uh, and she had the money to have help. It was part of the reason they charged a shilling. Uh, she was uh, um, never in lack of money. You might have noticed the elegant dress. She came from an aristocratic family, but uh, she did want the garden to support itself. So that's uh, how the shilling came about. Um, and that actually answers the question about the family's money. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I think they, the property was originally granted to them or to her, one of her ancestors by Queen Elizabeth, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's in the 1880s that the Noel is uh, given to them. And it, you know, if you go online, and I should have thought to have uh, put a picture in. It was this enormous property. It was, a, I mean, it's a huge castle. And she loved it. She really loved the Knoll, and it was when it was became a national trust. Uh, she no longer had the chance of inheriting it, which I think she always believed she would. She was the only um, the only heir in line, and and this displacement that she felt, I think, really pulled her originally to the Long Barn, which was a, another home that she and Harold Nicholson shared. Uh, but but for sure, it pulled her to to Sissinghurst this need to have a place, or this need to be grounded in a place. Uh, question, thanks, a question about another garden, uh, Charleston. Um, Peg asks, uh, how does Charleston fit into your talk? Um, and she said she visited there uh, some time ago in, in June in the summer, um, and that the uh, artists Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant live there. Um, so Wendy, go, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Vanessa Bell, for those who don't know, was Virginia Woolf's wife, uh, Virginia Woolf's wife, Virginia Woolf's sister, and she herself was a great painter. Um, and yeah, it, it was another kind of in between. When I think of, of that garden, when I think of Vanessa Bell, I think of her, you know, halfway in the world of Gertrude Jekyll and halfway in the world of William Robinson. Um, I have to say that I don't know a whole lot about that garden. Uh, I can find some uh, resources. But I did uh, appreciate you mentioning Vanessa Bell. When I was doing some research online, I thought surely Vanessa Bell painted gardens because of the role that gardens played 
in their time, the role they play in the literature, and also the spirit of the Bloomsbury group. And I could only find one painting that is, and I couldn't verify its authenticity. I think it's called Angelica. I think it was done by Vanessa Bell. And I think it is uh, done at Monk's house. Or maybe it's at Charleston. But I, I found it fascinating that she wasn't drawn to the garden as a subject matter. In fact, when I started to look at the modernists and what they were painting at the same time as as Vita Sackville West is working in Sissinghurst and uh, Virginia Woolf is, is writing in the lodge in Monk's house garden, it was surprising that, you know, for how hard the British landscape painters worked to legitimize landscape, that, that it just kind of vanishes all of a sudden and it becomes portraiture. Uh, there's lots of portraits during that time being painted. Um, the one place I may say that I see sort of being picked up this landscape tradition after an era, like I said, of a, a lot of portraits and then a lot of abstraction that dominated British painting uh, would be with David Hockney. Uh, I'm not sure if you know the works of David Hockney. He's a, a contemporary painter. Uh, he he was fascinated with the landscape again, and following Constable did these enormous paintings, these enormous canvases. Uh, he went big and he also went small. Uh, if you want to see some of his images of landscapes and of flowers, uh, uh, I'll be sure to put a, a link online, but you can Google it as well. Uh, he did a whole series of paintings on his iPad. Uh, trying to democratize art and take it out of the control of the art world. Uh, for a while, you could get a David Hockney uh, sent directly to your iPhone that he painted on his iPad. And many of those were of flowers and many of those were of landscape. So it, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how hard Gainsborough and Constable and Turner worked uh, to make the landscape, the British landscape in particular, to legitimize and valorize that painting and then how it sort of drops off. And, and, and we get little glimpses of it uh, in, in contemporary art. Anyways, sorry, that's a long aside. Uh, I wish I knew more about Charleston, but it is interesting about Bell not painting gardens when gardening was so much of their life. Um, a question actually about, I think about Gainsborough. Um, Irene asks about uh, a church Oh, I just clicked off it. That was uh, you showed a painting, either by Turner or by Gainsborough. I think it was by Gainsborough. She's that she's yeah. talking about about a church and what was that church called? Um, yes. What uh, what is this painting called? Which church? So, um, mm -hmm. Wendy, I'll let you look for that for a second. Um, Irene, if you have any more information, you could send it. Um, while Wendy looks for that, uh, Bobby asks about the tower that that tall tower that you see at Sissinghurst um so that was um date that tower dated from Elizabethan times and it was actually used as a prison um including during the seven years war um and then it was you know it's obviously still standing today it's been standing for several centuries it was used as a, a lookout tower as well during world war ii um, it actually was um, taken down and put back together again. Oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah. There, and Vita writes in her journals. Her journals are fascinating if you can uh, manage to read her terrible handwriting. But she writes about watching them take it down, parts of it down to reconstruct it and to just sort of solidify it uh, because it had been around, as you mentioned, for so long. And she writes about watching them with great worry that they wouldn't be able to put it back together again. Uh, she, I, sort of a Humpty Dumpty uh, question that, that was there uh, for her and a worry that she had. I'm quickly trying to find the answer to the question about that church. Uh, Melanie, is there another question while I continue? Yeah, to just try kind of a, a couple of practical questions. Um, again, everyone, if you didn't uh, see the Monet webinar, um, I will be putting it up on our website later today. It's been a little behind this week. And uh, we will have a link to this webinar in our email. A couple, a couple people ask, um, let's see, classical, is it classical pursuits or worldwide quest? Uh, so we do these webinars together. We've been partners for a long time in, run, in running our trips. Um, so we're working together to do these webinars. Um, 
in for the foreseeable future uh while we're all while we're all not traveling um and and then it's classical pursuits who runs our literary and cultural salon in toronto every year um and let's see i think um, can I just to that effect uh, intercede and the person that you don't see if you're watching these uh, armchair travel is yes. the amazing Samantha Clark, who, you know, I want to thank for coordinating and keeping us on schedule and making sure uh, that we're all ready to roll and our images are clear. She does uh, so much of the background work. And so thank you from all of us, Samantha, who are watching this. Uh, yeah. We don't get to hear you unless there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see you. But we know you're there and it gives us great comfort and, and so thank you. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to do these without um without a ton of help and support from from Samantha, who's working hard from home in Toronto. Um as everyone everyone at Worldwide Quest works from home. So thank you so much. Uh I have an answer. It's Salisbury, yeah. Salisbury Cathedral that ah, we're seeing okay. in the paintings. And okay. he did a whole series. And again, there are these six footers where you see these enormous paintings and, and the, I can't imagine, I wish we could like zip there right now and sit in front of one and see those, that big cathedral looming over the landscape. But uh, for the time being, at least we had it on the screen and we know it's Salisbury Cathedral. So thank you for the question. Um, I guess it looks like one last question here and then we'll, that, I, that didn't get to, we'll wrap up. Um, Actually, two. One question about Monet. Did he have gardeners? Uh, yes, he did. And I think Wendy, you talk about that in um, in last week's webinar. He did. Um, he, did. he had about eleven gardeners at the height of the. Uh, oh, there's eleven gardeners today. He had eight gardeners at the height of the time that he was uh, taking care of Giverny himself. And Beverly asks, um, was Vita's garden originally all white? So there's always been the white garden. There was always a portion of it that was all white. But she right from the start knew the plans, you know, the earliest drawings we have that she created, the rose garden was always there and that was not going to be white. Uh, again, she was following um, uh, Gertrude Jekyll and her desire if, if, to have lots of color in places. White where there's white, but color where there's color. So she had always had this kind of mixed view. Uh, go online though and look at the white garden because when I read uh, passages talking about how enchanted this place is, uh, this garden is, that's my first thought. And uh, you know, unfortunately, some images don't ca uh, copy over to um, screens particularly well. But there's these little nooks and there's these cutouts and hedges, and it's just magical. And really, what I I wish we could do, but we can't. And this isn't just because we're all self-isolating, uh, is to be there at night. Because the most, you know, white gardens are beautiful and enchanting in the daytime, but white gardens at night, that's when it's all happening, when you've got moonlight casting off uh, of the white flowers and the white against the black. So uh, a, a skill to create a good white garden, uh, depending especially where you are and your climate, uh, but if you can get away with it like Vita did and create one as beautiful as she did, beautiful in the daytime, beautiful at night. Okay. And uh, we had, a, okay, just these two quick questions and then, and then we should wrap it up. That's it. Uh, so um, first, uh, Bobby's asking if there were herb gardens at, at, in, at these places. Yeah, it all started, Gertrude Jekyll, you know, moved us from the, well, the traditional cottage garden, which was a garden of vegetables and herbs, uh, to the flower garden. Um, and yeah, there was a vegetable garden and a herb garden at both. I actually have the list of the herbs that she had in her garden, because I'm weird. <laughs> and I found it fascinating to see, I think she's got 37 herbs in her garden. I went, 37? I wasn't sure lot. there were 37. Uh, but we have the list of all the plants, uh, all the herbs that she put in. Uh, same thing with uh, Monk's house. There was always a big vegetable garden and always a big herb garden, you know, building again from that cottage garden tradition into a flower garden tradition. So uh, yes, they were there. And 
I will try to remember to put the herb list um, up online for you. Because yeah, we're going to have a whole encyclopedia coming for you. Um, well, I will send you. You know what? I'll send you the link and you can find it yourself. It's free. Uh, and then one last question um, before I um, could Wendy show her garden behind her. So what well, Wendy, while you get a ring, um, just a reminder, everybody that um, Wendy is back next week um, talking about Frida Kahlo, Casa Azul in uh, Mexico City and uh, Worldwide Quest um, with, uh, with Samantha and some of the leaders at Worldwide Quest, they do uh, webinars on, um, on bird watching and other nature topics as well. They've, they've been a leader in nature tours in Canada for a long time. Um, so if you are interested in other aspects of nature, um, they're having, they have a lot of really cool webinars on, um, on birds and the natural world. Um, so Wendy, show us your garden. Uh, so, I'm actually uh, on the third floor of our house, uh, and I am a big gardener. I love, I love seedlings and plants. If I wasn't a philosopher, I'd uh, be a gardener. I take great exception. We didn't make it on Vita's list. She's got painters and gardeners and poets, but I think philosophers should be there as well. Uh, and so what you're seeing is this is a big window that's behind me, and these are all plants that I've wintered over. Uh, some of the big ferns you see behind me are a few years. Well, some one of them is about 10 years old. I bring them out and I bring them in. Uh, the daffodils are waiting to go in the garden. We're going to have snow apparently tomorrow night here in Toronto, which isn't normal for those of you who don't know our climate. Uh, so I'm just waiting to get everything outside. Uh, so what you're seeing is my indoor garden. Uh, maybe if the weather changed, I'll have some pictures of the outdoors. Uh, by the time we get together this time next week to talk about Frida Kahlo's uh, magical re-envisioning of a garden, far from the tradition of Monet and far from the tradition uh, of uh, Vita uh, Sacco West and uh, Virginia Woolf. Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks to Wendy. A lot, a lot of nice comments to Wendy and about her presentation and her also her beautiful rose dress. Um, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. We hope to see you all back next week in Mexico City and um, stay well. Have a great week. Goodbye, everybody. Stay safe. Keep armchair traveling. Yes. Bye bye.